guys. So we are going to be taking some notes today on World War I, which at the time was called the Great War. So before we get started, let's go ahead and make sure that we know what our essential questions are that we're looking for. So at the end of these notes, you should be able to answer all three of these questions. And really, you should already know number one, which is what does M-A-I-N stand for and what does that have to do with World War I? Number two, I want you to be listening for what the new technologies that were introduced during World War I were and what made them um, important. And then the last is what were the effects of World War I? So go ahead and make sure you write these in your notes and as we go through you're looking for this information and you will mark that in your notes. All right, let's get going. So we've been talking the last few days about how the causes of World War I are not as simple as many people like to think. A lot of people like to boil it all down to one event that happened in July 1914. But really there were a lot of what we call prequels to this war. So first of all, there had already been a long period of time where there was ethnic unrest in this part of the world called the Balkans. So this really threatened a lot of major empires during this time. So for example, the Ottoman Empire was sort of struggling at this time. And as a result of these struggles between these different ethnic groups, then we see certain actions being taken by different groups of countries and different individual countries. So for instance, Germany starts becoming aggressive and decides to annex Austria to itself. And now, because Germany has become a major military power in Europe, and Britain is a major military power, this starts to catch the attention of their enemies, Britain. So we also saw the Haitian Rebellion happened prior to this, right? This is a long-term uh, prequel. So this was the first time that we saw an overthrow of slavery. Then we have Simone Bolivar and all of the Latin American revolutions that happened. So that had set off a lot of revolutions around the world. Mexico received their independence as a part of these revolutions. And Brazil had a bloodless revolution which was unique as well. So there is already a lot of change happening, political change, and a lot of fighting for nationalism, right? Of this idea of nationalism, this pride in, in one's nation to the point that it is becoming very aggressive is happening around the world. So we broke down the main causes of World War I the other day. So this is just a review. We won't go into detail on each of these, but we had militarism, so building up of arms on, and armaments and the mobilization of mil military bodies like armies and, and navies. Then we had alliances between different countries. So we had the two main alliances here that we'll talk about in just a second. So all these countries having these uh, allied relationships and choosing actions based on their obligations as part of these relationships. Imperialism, which was the building up of empires and this competition between different groups because of this desire to have the largest empire. And then of course, nationalism. So some of the things that happen a little bit closer to World War I breaking out. First we see the Ottoman Empire starts to collapse. So that includes these territories you see here in this map. So here the red line is depicting the edges of the Ottoman Empire. And so you see parts of Serbia and Austria-Hungary. So Austria and Hung Austria, Hungary and Russia are fighting over this territory at this time. And so this is starting to break apart the Ottoman Empire, which has lasted for a very long time. We learned about this last semester. We talked about the Ottomans. So this is the longest lasting empire in history, and it is starting to crumble at last. Um, so part of these struggles, Austria takes Bosnia and Herzegovina. So they become sort of their own territory. And within this territory is Sarajevo, which will come into play later. So the problem with this, um, with Austria taking this territory, is that these were lands that were previously owned by Serbia. right? And so obviously Serbia is not happy about this. And so when we did our reading of 
Sidney Bradshaw Fay's work the other day, um, he was talking about this. He was talking about this animosity between Serbia and Austria based on these events. And then also we saw Russia starting to mobilize for war. So Russia being up here in this corner, I'm kind of covering them, but um, they had started preparing for war. And because they are one of the largest, most powerful militaries in the world at this time, that sends off alarm bells in everyone else's heads, especially in Austria-Hungary and Germany. So Germany particularly is going to start mobilizing once it sees Russia doing that and this is going to escalate into war. But there is a reason why many people say that the Archduke Ferdinand being assassinated in July 1914 was the start of the war. Many people like to call this the spark that lit the fire that started this war. So they would say all of the things we just talked about on the previous slides, all of those prequels were basically they pictured it as a giant barrel full of gunpowder, what we'd call a powder keg. And so the Balkans, that part of the world that we saw on the map, was a powder keg. And picture like the old cartoons, right? You have the big barrel of gunpowder and it has the line, you know, string coming out of it. And someone lights that string and then the string burns and suddenly it explodes. So the idea was that all of this turmoil that was going on in the Balkans was just a powder keg waiting to explode, and the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is the spark that lit the flame that caused it to explode. So what happened? Well, the Archduke of Austria and his wife were in Sarajevo, and they were sort of doing this parade through town. They were driving in a convertible vehicle through the city. And there were Serbian nationalists that had been plotting to assassinate the Archduke. And they actually had already attempted to kill him during the day and missed. So a bomb had been thrown at his car and it bounced off the car and went into the crowd and hurt a bunch of people in the crowd. And Interestingly, the Archduke continued his tour around town and the assassin, the failed assassin, had run off and was hiding in a cafe. And he was sort of crying in his coffee when the car came back around. And so the assassin, Gavrilo Princip, saw the car coming back around and was like, oh my gosh, I have a second chance, and ran out with a gun and shot the Archduke and killed him. So this gave Austria-Hungary a reason to attack Serbia. They had already been at odds, they'd already had a bad relationship, and now this was what they, this was their excuse. So now we see escalations, right? All these other countries are going to declare war because they're all tied together in these alliances. So we know that Russia was on the side of Serbia, and so they felt the need to join up and support them and France and Britain were allies of Russia so they joined on this side and then we had you know the other side with Austria-Hungary they were already allied with Germany and Italy gets involved so we get two main alliances that are on these opposing sides of the war and those are the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance so the Triple Entente is what you see on this side and this is referring to the three major powers, the largest powers on this side of the war, which were Russia, France, and Great Britain. And then on the other side, the three major players on the Triple Alliance side, which is sometimes called the Central Powers, were Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary. Now here's where it gets a little confusing, because the Triple Entente is often called the Allies, but then this is called the Triple Alliance, so well, that's kind of confusing. So I like to remember, okay, if you think about it, and you probably can guess, be, just based on how your feelings of political, you know, relationships between countries now, which side does the United States join? Because they're not in it in the beginning, but we know we're going to join eventually. If you guessed the triple entente, you're correct, right? We know that we are in good relationship with Great Britain and France, and Russia's a question mark, right? But we know that, you know, we fought on this side. And so that's why the Triple Entente is called the Allies in 
this part of the world because they were our allies. So how does it all really kick off? How how does the how does the actual how does the fighting begin? Germany sort of starts the uh, the real aggression because what they do is they are sandwiched between two allies. They are located in between France to the west and then Russia to their east. And so they decide that they really don't want to get stuck having to split their army up onto two different sides of their country to fight two different enemies. So they think, okay, let's take out France first. They, they seem like the little brother. They're the easier ones to take out. So they think this is going to be an easy win. Let's go take out France first, and then we'll put all our effort into fighting Russia. This is what's called the Schleifen Plan. And part of the Schleifen Plan was that they were going to attack France by going through Belgium. So it would be too obvious to come this direction, right? This is Germany. This is France. Obviously, the French are going to be prepared for them to come through here, but they may not expect them to come through Belgium. The problem with this is if you notice, Belgium is a neutral nation. So they go through a neutral territory, which is seen as just bad form. This is crossing a line um, literally and figuratively. So Great Britain sees this as unacceptable, and this brings Great Britain into the war. They declare war on Germany after they march through Belgium. And this helps the you know British leader that had been kind of trying to stay out of things but wanted to get involved, but his, his cabinet was sort of split. They weren't agreeing on whether they should declare war or not, and he didn't have their full support. Now he has their full support because everyone says that's not okay. So... <clears throat> Take a look at this map, and I want you to look at the two groups that are fighting here. So in the green, we see the Triple Entente, the Allies, and then in the orange, we see the Triple Alliance, the Central Powers. So you can already guess why these are called the Central Powers, because they're located in the center. Think about what is an advantage and a disadvantage for the location of the Triple Alliance. Try to think about that. Pause the video and see if you can think of an answer. All right, so one advantage you might notice is that all of the central powers border each other. So they can quickly support each other militarily. They can communicate more easily. So they're all, all their power is located in one, one strong force in the, in the center. But this is also a disadvantage, right? Because they have enemies on both sides. So they're having to fight on multiple fronts. Right now, I want you to switch the script and think, what are some of the advantages for the Triple Entente? And what might be some disadvantages? You probably guess it's kind of the opposite, right, of the Triple Alliance. So for the Triple Entente, they're split. They're further apart, so getting reinforcements to each other, getting supplies to each other, communicating with each other is a little more difficult for them. But the advantage is that they are able to engage their enemies on multiple fronts and they have that advantage in that way. Okay, so the war starts on the Western Front, and it starts with a really long stalemate because basically both sides are evenly matched. Neither side has a real advantage, so they get stuck, and something called trench warfare begins. So a trench is what you see in the pictures here, which is basically a ditch dug into the ground, and both sides had to dig in, and hole up and just try to hold their ground. So there were these trenches dug all throughout this territory, and a lot of them are still there. You can still see evidence of the trenches that were dug in the ground. And soldiers literally lived in these trenches for months and months at a time. And depending on where you were, some of them were pretty decent, and some of them were terrible. Some of them were really gross. A lot of them got a lot of mud and water in them and men were just having to stand in water all the time and they would get things called trench foot which was really nasty their feet would swell up and get infected lots of rats and other critters running around with carrying who knows what kind of diseases so it was not a fun time um, and there was the stress of constantly being dug in the ground and, and being shot at by the other side and, and even just to poke your head up above was extremely risky and often got many people killed or shot and hurt. So the territory between these trenches was called no man's land and it's this idea that no man can cross it. 
This is no man's land, Diana. It means no man can cross it, all right? This battalion has been here for nearly a year, and they, they barely gained an inch. All right, because on the other side, there are a bunch of Germans pointing machine guns at every square inch of this place. This is not something you can cross. It's not possible. You see this in a lot of movies that depict World War I. There are a lot of scenes where they sort of show you what this was like. And there are a lot of, a lot of accurate descriptions of what it might have been like to, to be in the trenches. So one of your essential questions and one of the biggest things that makes World War I unique and makes it significant is all of the new technology that was being used in warfare for the first time. So up until this point, technology hadn't reached a, a you know, this height of sophistication. So in wars prior to 1914, there weren't aircrafts, there weren't tanks, there weren't things like submarines or Unterseeboots, which is the German word, right? A U-boat is comes from Unterseeboot, which undersea boat, right? So sub. Poison gas was a, a particularly brutal one that was new. Both sides used chemicals like mustard gas to poison each other, and that was particularly horrifying to soldiers because it could blind you, it was very painful, and it could kill you, you could suffocate. So that's why you see a lot of these pictures of soldiers wearing their gas masks. And a lot of civilians had gas masks during World War One and World War Two because of the use of poison gas. Grenades were new, and we had more powerful bombs. So some of the new weaponry that was being used were flamethrowers, the early machine guns that were being used. So this was totally, totally new, and all of these things were brand new, and they were being thrown at these soldiers, all of them. And so one thing that was not anticipated was the psychological impact of that on these soldiers. And so many World War I soldiers, all of them had trauma from going through this, and we kind of look at that and go, well, duh. But at the time, that was not always the case. Before this, you you had swords, you know, you had maybe rifles, you had guns, but you were shooting from far away and you were killing one man at a time and there wasn't this mass killing and destruction at this level in warfare before. And it wasn't as, um, it, it, it wasn't quite as traumatizing as this was. This was a whole new level that no one was prepared for. So these soldiers, Many, many came back, and those who were lucky to sur enough to survive didn't necessarily have a great life after the war. They struggled with post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't recognized as a thing at the time. So a lot of what we know now comes from learning from World War I. And as you saw in the video from the other day, people prior to World War I saw war generally as a good thing. It was an opportunity, right? They saw it as a way for their nation to build its power to gain territory and resources. And this is a real reason why after World War I, that completely changed and it has, has changed ever since. Because just the, the sheer destruction and horror of what these this new technology did to people and cities um, really left an impact on everyone. The typical weapons, of course, we expect, but also media was being used as a weapon. So propaganda was an important part of the war effort. And propaganda you've probably heard of, but basically propaganda is the use of media um, and the spreading of ideas through the public um, in such a way to sway them to support or be against a certain idea. So it's trying to spread ideas. It's very one-sided usually. Propaganda usually employs a lot of different tactics, which we'll talk about when we go into World War II, some of which are very, I mean, all of which are, are manipulative and some are very dastardly. Oftentimes they use stereotyping and racism to depict their enemies in a way that dehumanizes them. So it is very questionable morally, but it was very effective. And so propaganda was extremely important in the war effort. It was used on both sides, both to gain support for the allies of your country and also to convince people to hate their enemy. It was widely, widely used to encourage men to enlist and join the army. It was used to encourage women to help the war effort by rationing food or volunteering as nurses or working in factories. So 
it was used in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it was used to, to get an emotional response from people, right? So you see here like all these soldiers lined up and there's this British leader saying, who's absent? Is it you? Like, are you not doing what you should do for your country? Um, there was a lot of shame for any young men that weren't off in the war fighting, some of whom couldn't go because the army rejected them for medical reasons, or there were there were certain reasons some men couldn't go, and, and that was often very hard for them. What is it? A white feather, of course, coward. Stop this at once! This is neither the time nor the place. These people should be aware that there are cowards among them. Will you please leave? You are the cowards here, not they! Because they were ridiculed back home and they were sort of ostracized socially. Um, also, there's there's even just in the, the way that the things are depicted, like you see this German soldier with the typical German helmet and it is very dark and looks very spooky and evil and and showing you know, depicting the enemy in a very negative light. So it could be very, very influential. So you might be wondering, okay, the U.S. wasn't involved in the beginning, so how did we get involved in the war? For the first few years of the war, which broke out in 1914, the United States stayed mostly neutral. They didn't really want to get involved, but there were certain things that started to change American opinions about whether or not we should get involved. And one of those things happened in May 1915, and this is when German U-boats, German submarines, sunk a ship called the Lusitania. And the Lusitania was a British passenger ship that was carrying passengers from several different countries, including a hundred American civilians. It was not a military ship, so it didn't, it was not carrying soldiers or weapons. It was just a passenger cruise ship, basically. And the Germans said it was getting too close to our territory, so we we sank it. And they killed 100 Americans in this attack. So this was very big for everyone involved, and especially was really big in swaying public opinion in the United States. And not completely, though. So Americans weren't quite ready to jump into the war, but they did they were angry now at Germany and had a reason to to be very angry with Germany. They called for an end to this unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning that Germany was saying, we're not going to, you know, wait to see who it is. If someone is coming into our territory, we're going to attack them. So you just need to stay out. And the U.S., you know, saw this as unfair and called for an end to this. So... This starts to become a war of attrition where no side is, is gaining anything. It's just this stalemate still. So this is sort of step one to the United States getting into the war. But the final straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, is when Germany sends a letter to Mexico, to the Mexican government. And it is sent by a representative of Germany named Zimmerman. And Zimmerman sends a telegram and basically says that they want to join up with Mexico and fight against the United States. And they tr they want Mexico to help them attack the U.S. And so the letter ends up getting intercepted before it reaches its destination. And the information is shared with the United States government. And so this is seen as Germany basically throwing the gauntlet. So the United States declares war on Germany in 1917. So this is two years after the Lusitania was sunk. And now that the United States gets involved on the side of the Allies, this really tips the scales to the advantage to the Allies. So it gives the Triple Entente the advantage. And at this point, it becomes what we would call total war. And total war means that it's a war being fought by a country that affects every part of that country's society. So we think of like recent wars like the war in Afghanistan. Well, that didn't dramatically change life on U.S. soil in the sense that not every aspect of society was contributing to that war effort and it wasn't everywhere you looked. It certainly affected a lot of Americans, especially those with family in the military, but it did not necessarily change what we ate or how we did school or what jobs we had. 
Whereas during World War I, that was the case. So people were rationing food to try to send more food to the soldiers to be able to support the army. So people were, you know, had to get food, um, ration tickets to be able to go get food and groceries. So they were having to get creative in the kitchen because they had limited ingredients. Women were starting to join the workforce for the first time and um, or really leaving the home more than ever to go work in factories and do things that men were usually doing. This changed not just everyday life, but also big scale things. So the government's power increased over everyday life and especially over the economy because they had to they had to take over more of the economy so that they could fund the war effort. You see an increase in propaganda and because women are getting more involved, they start to, you know, push for more equal rights because they are now on their own. All the men have gone off to fight and a lot of women are left home to take care of their families by themselves. So they are starting to push for more equal rights. So like I said, they, they were women were taking men's places in the workforce. This was seen as a temporary thing that they were supposed to just help keep things running back home while their husbands and sons and brothers were off fighting. But this really helped open a lot of women's eyes to the fact that they could do the same things that men were doing and that they deserved equal rights. And one of the first rights they wanted to fight for was the right to vote because in World War One, women still couldn't vote. So women's suffrage, meaning the right to vote, became very popular, a very popular movement, not just in the United States, but also in European nations. Another group that is has an interesting role in World War One is the black community. So African Americans did fight in World War One. That's often a question that I get asked. And really, most of the African American soldiers in World War One fought in these groups. They were in the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions, or the 370th Infantry Regiment. So for the 92nd and 93rd, these guys were called, they were nicknamed the Harlem Hellfighters. And they played a really important role in several battles during World War One, including the Second Battle of the Marne and the Meuse or Argonne Offensive. And so they were unique in that they were soldiers who were fighting for a country that wasn't giving them equal rights. Even when they join the army and are fighting, they're still being segregated into different barracks and into different groups. And um, one thing that is interesting is that when they go overseas, they interact with the French a lot and they, they actually fought with the French mostly on the allied side. And the French were a lot more open-minded and treated them with a lot more respect than the Americans or the British soldiers. And then the 370th Infantry Regiment was the only unit to be commanded by black officers during World War I. And this guy right here is Sergeant Henry Johnson. He was one of the Harlem Hellfighters, and he was actually the first American soldier to be awarded the French Croix de Guerre, which is the Cross of War, which is kind of it's a it's a military honor basically comparable to the American Medal of Honor. So that is a huge deal that the first American soldier to be awarded this medal by the French government was an African American soldier.